So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Michael Brunt to present the video on George Bursey. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards, Dr. Schweitzberg, members of the college and guests. In 2011, Steve Schweitzberg, who was uh, SAGE's president then, called me and said, George Bursey just turned 90, and he won the Jacobson Award from the college. And he asked me if I would produce a short film to tell George's story. I had no idea what an incredible story it would turn out to be, because this is much more than the story of one of the great surgical innovators of our lifetime who touched every phase of endoscopic surgery. Optics, illumination, laparoscopic instrumentation, photographic documentation, you name it. But it's also a story of resourcefulness, persistence, perseverance of one man against all odds. Now the full documentary film is 56 minutes and it only tells part of the story. Today you're going to see a 15 minute edited version, thanks to Steve Schweitzberg's remarkable video editing skills, of this incredible surgical life. Um, the full-length documentary with an additional 45 minutes of uh, very interesting vignettes and stories is available at the Sages booth in the exhibit hall. Um, and I would highly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at it and to show it to your fa fellow faculty and surgical trainees. And so now with generous support from SAGES, the SAGES Foundation, thanks to Cinemed, thanks to the college for doing this Heroes of Surgery session, it's my pleasure to present George Bursey, Trials, Triumphs, and Tribulations. The foundations of modern endoscopic imaging go back nearly a half century and it was largely a result of the innovations of one man who persisted in developing this technology at a time when few other surgeons were interested or saw any value in the use of a laparoscope in surgical practice. You remember that in 1962, when he was still in Australia, he had written that he, it seemed inconceivable to him that surgeons weren't more engaged and hadn't adopted the techniques of laparoscopy. How prophetic he was even then. George Bercy was born in Zegat, Hungary in 1921 to a family of musicians. At age two, the family moved to Vienna, where his father had obtained a job as assistant conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic. By the age of 10, he was playing concertos and serving as the youngest concertmaster in the history of the school orchestra. After completing high school in 1939, he wanted to attend the university medical school, but was unable to gain admission because of the restrictions on Jews. Instead, he obtained a position as an apprentice in an electrical shop for one year and then worked for two years in mechanical engineering. And I have to admit that at later stage, it was a help for me because I know how to mill, how to drill, I could measure, uh, and I can make drawings. During World War II, young Jewish men in Hungary were conscripted to work in labor camps across Eastern Europe. In 1942, uh, my age group, between 22 and 24 years old, uh, were uh, called in to labor camp. Later, Bercy's unit was sent to Poland, where he worked unloading explosives for the Germans. Eventually, with the Russian advance in the east, they were moved back to Budapest, where they were to be transported to other camps in Germany or Poland. However, only this time, it was not to labor camps. They were going to put them all on trains now that they knew that they didn't need a labor crew anymore because the war was almost over. They were taking them back to the railroad station to put them on trains to Auschwitz and Birkenau. And they put us in a large, last uh, carriage and somehow the brakes, they couldn't release it. And after one hour, they're playing around. We were there, 85 youngsters. I left this carriage there, took the rest of it. They detached his car and they took the rest to Auschwitz. In June 1944, during an American air raid over Budapest, the guards for Dr. Bursey's unit disappeared and he and his fellow prisoners escaped. The first thing is I removed, we had a yellow armband. I removed my armband 
And by coincidence, I found my mother. One day, Dr. Bursey was out looking for a job, waiting for the tram, when someone recognized his Viennese accent. It turned out it was a member of the Hungarian underground who needed German speakers. That time, life didn't mean very much because we saw how many of our friends were killed. Therefore, you became very fatalistic. You really couldn't care less. In January 1945, Budapest was liberated by the Russians. In 1945, Bercy was accepted into medical school at the university in Zegen. To help pay for expenses, he worked evenings as a technician in the Department of Physiology and Biochemistry. In the fourth year, he won a prize from the Department of Surgery, which gave him free room and board. And he worked almost every night giving anesthesia for emergency cases and helping the nurses clean instruments. In 1950, he graduated from medical school and started his surgical training in Zegged. It was during surgical residency that Bercy became interested in experimental work. His first study was looking at methods for preservation of arteries, work which they subsequently published in 1951. In October 1956, Dr. Bercy was working in the University Hospital in Budapest as a general surgeon when the Hungarian Revolution overthrew the communist government in Hungary. The Hungarians' freedom was short-lived, however, as several days later the Soviet Politburo reversed course and sent troops into Hungary to crush the revolution. In the central square in Budapest, they suddenly opened fire on thousands of demonstrators. The hospital where Dr. Bercy was stationed was nearby and received numerous casualties. We received in within an hour, we were very near to the parliament, relatively near, approximately 250 severely injured people. Following the escape from Hungary, Dr. Bercy obtained temporary work at a university clinic in Vienna. He then interviewed for and was awarded a two-year Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. With that support, he decided in 1957 to leave Europe and immigrate to Australia. Why Australia? George listened a lot to Radio Free Europe, and in the United States in the 50s, they were talking about the possibility of a communist infiltration, that they were coming to our shores at any moment. And George just decided, I'm not going any place where somebody's going to be landing on the shores where there's going to be another war. And he just thought, Australia, nobody's going there. In 1957, you arrived in Australia with a Rockefeller Fellowship, not speaking a word of English, and having no idea where you were going to work. That's correct. Within six months, he'd learned enough English to communicate and began running an experimental surgery program. His early work focused on the problem of portal hypertension and esophageal varices in an induced canine model of cirrhosis. As a part of the study, he began performing laparoscopy in the animals to assess their livers. For this work, he won the Glisson Prize of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and was awarded with a lectureship position at the University of Melbourne the first ever given in surgery in Australia to a foreigner. He also was able to obtain a medical license and operating privileges at the University Hospital. Soon his interest shifted from portal hypertension to the biliary system and the problem of common bile duct stones. And this brought me to the idea of seeing the cystoscope, that why don't we use something to look into the tunnel to see what we're doing or what we should do. Bercy began using a cystoscope to examine the interior of the bile duct, but the image was dark and visualization was poor. This is where my coin dropped, that we have to find a better system. At that time, cholangiography was also very primitive and involved use of still images only. So he brought a fluoroscope into the operating room and began using it to perform cholangiograms. It was the first such unit in Australia and one of the first in the world. Bercy also began performing laparoscopy clinically, initially to do biopsies for staging oncology patients. In 1959, Bercy visited the Royal Technical Institute in London, where he met with the chairman there, who was one of the inventors of image amplification. Bercy arranged to meet Hopkins, who was somewhat suspicious of foreigners with a strong accent over dinner. He took me to the lab and he showed me his prototype. And then I saw from the performance that this is a revolution in optics. 
Sometime after that, Bercy made contact with the head of a company whom he had met a year earlier who was interested in surgical instrumentation and visualization. The head of that company was a man by the name of Carl Stortz. Uh, you have to develop a new polishing, gut glass cutting, etc., to get these rod lenses. And Stortz was interested in this. Bercy persuaded Stortz and his daughter Sybil to go to London to meet Hopkins. Storch was likewise impressed and was able to purchase the license to the rod lens technology, but it took time to develop the machinery to produce the glass rods. Professor Bercy and my father have had one specific characteristic in common. They were not satisfied and almost restless until ideal solution was found. That means that many discussions, many uh, prototypes has been made and produced and tested. Within two years, Stortz began manufacturing Hopkins rod lens scopes for surgical use. Initially, cystoscopes where the demand was greatest, and later laparoscopes. I, I think George Bercy's greatest contribution is the early work he did with Carl Stortz on the rod lens telescope, because that's the tool that really made laparoscopy possible. Meanwhile, Bercy became interested in recording images seen through the endoscope and in 1960 developed the first TV camera for recording endoscopic procedures. With the help of an electrical engineer, Bercy was able to get a one half inch camera video tube produced which weighed only a couple of ounces. He began recording images with this new system and in 1961, at a time when many families did not even have television, published a paper entitled Medicine and Television. In 1962, Bercy began a year of fellowship with Henry Harkins at the University of Washington in Seattle. It was also there that he got the first kolidokoscope from Carl Storrs and, with Harkins, began using it in the operating room. He met the chairman of the Department of Surgery, Leon Morgenstern, who would become a lifelong colleague and friend. Well, I invited Dr. Bercy in 1967 to uh, join the Department of Surgery as a visiting scholar or a visiting scientist for a year. As a result of his work on various prototypes across multiple disciplines, Morgan Stern invited Bercy in 1969 to join the full-time faculty at Cedars as director of a multidisciplinary surgical endoscopy unit, a completely new concept at that time. He quickly became involved in uh, the surgical procedures in nearly all of the surgical departments, even when they didn't ask him. He made a lot of requests, and uh, <clears throat> I wasn't sure I could afford what he asked for, but I gave him what he wanted. Bercy's work during the 1970s at Cedars impacted virtually every surgical specialty. His improvements to the cystoscope transformed the field, improving diagnostic cystoscopy and leading to a shift from open prostatectomy to transurethral resection for benign prostatic hypertrophy. With Paul Ward, he developed a 5mm indirect laryngoscope that replaced mirror laryngoscopy, and he also developed a direct operative laryngoscope with Ed Cantor. He introduced colonoscopy at Cedars, and in 1973 published the first series of 100 successful colonoscopic polypectomies. This is a uh, drawing that uh, George and I uh, sent back and forth to each other back in the 70s of a bipolar snare. And based on these drawings, we would build models and try them out. And this is what uh, George was so, so good at. And George developed a right angle scope with Stortz and then introduced it. And it became the standard before flexible uh, colidocoscopes. And, and George was the father of that. And people forget that he was the master of the common bile duct. One of Bercy's greatest contributions to surgery during the 1970s, however, was his work on illumination for endoscopic visualization. The globe arc light in use at that time generated tremendous heat and was prone to explosions. We found this ceramic globe, which was developed by the American Army, that uh, we got this one, and we built the first unit, and it was marvelous. And today, 32 years later, every endoscopic manufacturer the minority using the same globe. The other problem that remained to be solved was the inability to project images in the OR onto a TV monitor in color. But in 1984, he became aware of a miniature television camera that had been developed by Sircon 
that Bercy helped rebuild so it could be sterilized. Along with his prior work on the laparoscope, the safer and improved light source and acceptable color video system were the two final pieces needed to extend endoscopic surgery to other areas. In 1992, Bercy was nominated to serve as president of SAGES. In his SAGES presidential address, he spoke about many issues in GI surgery that are as pertinent today as they were in 1993. The importance of training and education, patient safety, controlling costs of healthcare, and being careful not to utilize technology for its own sake, but only for the benefit of the patient. We should always push the envelope, he said, but sometimes we shouldn't mail the letter. He still sleeps with a yellow pad next to his bed so that if he gets up with an idea in the middle of the night or early in the morning, he can draw it. In 2011, Dr. Bercy was honored by the American College of Surgeons as the 17th recipient of the Jacobson Award in recognition of his pioneering contributions over 50 years to the art and science of endoscopy and laparoscopy. And Bercy has recently received long overdue recognition in his native Hungary, where he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Simmelweis University in Budapest where they also named a building after him, the George Bercy Surgical Training and Research Laboratory. At the age of 90, George Bercy continues to innovate and develop new ways to improve surgical technology. Among his contributions since he retired from surgical practice has been the development of video endoscopic means for intubation under direct visual control. I think it's instructive for people who wonder if you can be productive to look at George's CV and see what he's done since he was 80. So George is in this unique category of people who have spent a lifetime even into their 90s. And there are very few people that can look back and say, I innovated my whole life. Even though I was 90 years old, I was still trying to make the world a better place. Uh, you'd think that George uh, at 90 would have uh, stopped thinking. Every day he has a new idea, and he'll call me up and he said, you know, if we took a scope and mounted it above the spine, then the spinal surgeon and everyone else in the room could see into the uh, field better, and it would be magnified. It's so logical, but no one thought of it but George. And he then doesn't stop with the idea. He implements it. He drives you crazy until you try it, and then you go, why didn't I think of that? He, he's a visionary. That was a truly extraordinary uh, video. Um, I'm sure we've got plenty of people that want to get up and talk a little bit more about what Dr. Bercy has meant to their own lives and make some additional comments. You'll have to. Oh, you can't do it. Can you get me? Uh, no. Yes, I can. So um, <clears throat> I think that uh, none of us had any prepared remarks except to say briefly that it's not just about the scientific contributions that George made. The inspiration that George uh, provides for all of us is the knowledge that you just got to keep going through all adversity, and when you have a good idea, and when something makes sense, you have to fight to make it happen. That's what George has done. He always states the obvious and fights for the obvious, and uh, he doesn't worry about uh, politics, and he doesn't worry about uh, political correctness sometimes, but uh, George is always there to make things better for human beings as well as for patients. So. Uh, I'm privileged to know him, and anyone who knows him feels the same way. Yeah, my name is Nat Soper from Chicago. Um, when I first came on the surgical field, it was just as laparoscopy was, was hitting stride, and SAGES was the organization that was really making it happen. <clears throat> my first SAGES meeting, I go, and I see this little gnome of a man um, whose English still is a little bit challenging, uh, even after this many years in English-speaking countries, but I was blown away by this guy, by his thought process, and still today, earlier in this meeting, he comes up to me, Nat, I've got a great idea, let's talk about it. 
It's, it's truly remarkable. And then when you hear, and, and Mike and Steve, incredible, uh, distilling this down to 15 minutes has got to be one of the biggest challenges ever. Um, and to understand what went into this years and years ago that have built the foundation for much of what we do today is truly remarkable. George, you're an incredible guy. You know, one of the, the biggest challenges in this was what I left on the cutting room floor. Mike Brunt put his heart and soul into this when I, when I asked him to do this. And for, for people that want to see the rest of the story, there is an hour-long video that there's just so much other stuff. But in, in addition to George, we're going to see uh, some other really amazing stories that talk about the heroes in surgery. And we've been working hard on the video-based education uh, committee to really uh, build the legacy, the surgical legacy, because there are heroes throughout the, the specialties. We're going to hear about Denton Cooley and Stan Dudrick and Olga Johansson. And we really want to capture these stories and, and try to figure out how to educate the public that surgeons have made remarkable contributions, not only to the history of medicine, but to people and to the world. And uh, it, it's at a time where the public really deserves to hear some of these stories as, as well. So it's been really an, an honor to be able to participate. Thank you, Steve. Let's um, move on.